the fire truck itself is actually 1.7 million and the additional funding was for some tools that I'll explain shortly. Um, we did pretty much settle on one manufacturer uh, for the truck, which was Seagrave. Um, they are on the NJAP, which is a cooperative buying network that we've bought several trucks off before uh, for the town garage. But um, we were initially looking around 1.2 million uh, when we started this about 18 months ago and with the increases um, every month that goes by we are uh, we're now at 1.7 um, the additional 300,000 that I'm, I'm requesting there's a few uh, certain tools that are on the truck the rescue equipment so this truck if, if we did get it approved is going to uh, take about two and a half years to build the additional rescue equipment that's on our truck now uh, is coming to its shelf life, which is about five to seven years. So I think it's appropriate to add the extrication equipment in on this truck as opposed to taking the equipment we have now, moving it over, and then in after the truck's built, it would be about two to four years. We would be coming back at you for the additional money to replace the equipment. Uh, the manufacturer for the rescue equipment has um, is no longer going to support the low pressure hearst equipment for extrication equipment. Uh, so that's one one of the biggest ticket items and the additional equipment that I want to add to this. And then I have a few other little things that we wanted to add to this that's normally done with the purchase of a truck. And maybe Brian, you can explain to him what the truck actually does. Uh, so this is the heavy rescue for Darien. This is what covers I-95 and all the local roads for motor vehicle accidents. If there's somebody that's trapped in a vehicle, this is the truck that carries all that equipment. Uh, any type of hazmat spills, this truck's got it. Um, there could be uh, rope rescue, uh, cold water rescue, uh, somebody falls through the ice, that's this truck that, that goes. Um, we are going with a slightly bigger truck. Uh, there's a couple pieces of equipment we want to add to the truck that we currently don't have on the rescue now. That's kind of leaning towards to bring us into the times with the EV, the electric vehicles. There's a couple of uh, firefighting pieces of equipment that I want to add to it, uh, as well as uh, there's a small boat that would go in one of the compartments for uh, some of the flooding issues we've had in, in recent times that I sure some of you guys have seen so okay so you you take delivery in two and a half years about two and a half years okay so am I hearing right that this fire truck could put out a EV fire? so it's gonna have some additional equipment on it mm -hmm. um, there's something called a EV fire blanket mm -hmm. that's one of the pieces that I want to put on this truck um, and then there's additional heavy struts which are used to stabilize tractor trailers okay. in, in a large uh, motor vehicle accident. So there's some additional equipment that we don't have currently that we're, we're adding to this. Right. This, uh, if you don't mind me, this is Larry's, uh, my assistant chief. Yeah, Larry Gasline, first assistant chief. Right. Um, this is one of the primary. Uh, um, pieces of apparatus that would respond to any sort of building construction incident or um, building collapse type incident. So, you know, the discussions that you're having about building new schools, you're seeing new developments all across town. This is one of the primary things that would be bringing equipment to any sort of scene that would help in that sort of incident as well. So there's a variety of uses uh, for this. It's sort of bringing all of the tools uh, to the scene in a much of a more efficient manner than what we have today. A uh, couple of questions, just to your point, but we won't, by the time we get this in two years, the, those construction projects will be completed. Sure. Right? sure. Okay. So the existing physical plant that we have, uh, these are going to be, this is going to be a larger truck, it's going to be a heavier truck. Will our, wherever it's housed, do we have an appropriate size, an appropriate yes. so it will stabilized? 
environment for this? So this is this will fit in the bay that the current rescue is already in. There's okay. nothing that has to be done to change any of that. We don't need a, an addition or anything like that to, to house the truck. It's it's not it's not significantly bigger than what we got now. It's just a little bit bigger. We're looking to create an additional compartment on each side. Okay. And if you could just you know for people who may be uh, watching at home and because it's a significant amount of money, if you could just give an idea of the usage and when you know people in Darien would see you know, historically uh, this vehicle rolling out and, and doing what? So any type of motor vehicle accident that occurs in our district on I-95, um, we do get quite a few calls on 95. So this is the primary piece of equipment for extricating somebody out of a vehicle. Um, any type of hazmat spill that could happen, you know, we've had incidents all over town where we need to apply certain types of uh, equipment out, whether it be the diapers, speedy dry, booms, anything like that, that this will be on that truck. Um, any type of rescue, it could be a confined space rescue that uh, when the sewer department's working with a contractor and they have somebody in the hole, this truck will have the equipment on it to go out and be able to rescue that individual if there was an issue with him in a confined space. Um, yeah, each truck, you know, when the alarm bells go off, there's a, there's a very specific choreography of how we respond, right? So we have engines, we have a ladder, and then we have heavy rescue, right? We have a tanker truck as well that brings additional water to the fire. But that choreography is dictated by what the dispatch is, right? And so the heavy rescue will roll to a lot of the incidents that Chief Ransford is explaining. And you bring up a very good point about, you know, the, um, you know, a lot of the projects may be completed, but I'm sure there will be new projects coming online thereafter, right? There's always a changing nature in, in what we see, right? The rescue that we have today uh, was built in 2004, if I'm not mistaken, and you know, there's an antiquated nature of some of these things, that things that we plan for in 2000, 2002 to get that built in 2004, as you might imagine, with new developments, you know, with technological changes, the natures of emergencies are changing. And so what we're trying to do is be able to respond to those in a very efficient manner and what we see on the horizon. Every time we think we've seen, we've been doing this a long time, every time we think we've seen something, <laughs> something new happens. And so we're trying to make sure that we're building a truck that is gonna meet anything that we could foresee and maybe not even foresee, but be able to mitigate in a very quick nature and so this truck, the way that it's been, des uh, been designed and the planning that has gone into it is sort of bring all of the tools to bear at a very quick and efficient manner as soon as the, as the alarm bells go off. Thank you. Yeah. And a couple of questions. This is an astronomical amount of money. I mean, it is, it's, I remember when we were debating or uh, talking about uh, ladder trucks on the Board of Finance, and I think that was early in my tenure, and uh, the truck came up and it was, what, $1.1 million? <coughs> and I thought it was going to have to be defibrillated. Maybe someone in <laughs> the fire department had one of those units with them, and, that, and, and I know this has tools on it. Now we're talking about twice as much money to buy a single truck. And I'm just kind of wondering in the scheme of all this, um, I always have this kind of regular question with these discussions as to whether we've had a fresh look at our fire equipment list, what's on that list, longevity of these vehicles, the right balance among all the departments, kind of all that stuff. And then second, you know, if I think about a, a truck like this, I do have the fiery crash on 95 or the complex extraction or rescue that has to be done. I'm just wondering whether for our town, uh, the frequency with which this truck is going to be used on stuff like that and whether at some point you say the complexity of that rescue is so much so that it's better for the town to depend on Norwalk or Stanford which are much bigger and more substantive departments than we have uh, a greater variety of specialized equipment and are mere minutes away in terms of distance whether we've kind of thought about that I just I, I see this discussion about this piece of equipment and I worry kind of what's coming down the pike that we're now spending twice as much money on fire trucks and sort of equipment 
uh, or at least there's the prospect of that. And um, I, I just wonder, also hearing your description of what's going to be on the truck, whether we're getting, you know, some some mission creep in there as well, and, and becoming so capable on some of these things that we're maybe losing the focus on uh, making some trade-offs in terms of the equipment that we're buying. So. Can I, if I could address some of that, John? Um, we had commissioned an emergency services study, um, which I do have the draft report. I received it on Thursday. Um, not ready to share the whole report yet, um, but it does. Con that report contemplated this, and um, it does endorse Support. the need for this truck. Um, and I would remind you that these trucks will last 20 years. So $2 million is, is a lot of money, but remember, it's a, it's a 20 year vehicle. Um, and then I don't really think it's mission creep, um, what they're doing. Um, I may be biased. Is that a necklace sale? <laughs> sure, um, this is actually rescue, is what my husband does. We know. Um, <laughs> This, it, it belongs with the fire departments. Um, we don't have another entity in town um, that is capable of the type of specialized rescue work that they do. I mean, our, our police do wonderful work, but, um, you know, where they, they might, I don't think we have a scuba team at the, at the moment, but things like a confined space rescue. You're not gonna wanna wait for Norwalk or Stanford to get here. If we have any kind of a um, building collapse, that's not something that the police will have the equipment to be able to go in and do. It's the fire department is 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 the appropriate place for it. Okay. And yeah. is this, I'm sorry, is this truck kind of required for all the new construction that we have? Is maybe that an issue that you need? I'm sorry, say that again. All the new construction we have in town is this the this this kind of truck necessary maybe from an insurance standpoint or uh, um it, you know it's not for all the new construction that you know what i think you're going to be more concerned about with the new construction might be the ladders um okay. and pumpers um but you know this is a, about a lot about the highway and the motor vehicles um the responsibility that the department has for 95 um but they do do the other the other tasks as well. And then one other question: Should we be reading through this study before we make a decision like this? This study supports this. This study supports. I don't know about having read it. Trust me. <laughs> well, I I I need to um, go over some of the recommendations with them, and, and I'd like to see some revisions in the study. Then I will be giving it to the board of selectmen. Okay. You know what? To John's point, I mean, when I looked through this, I had the same, you know, sense of, you know, uh, sticker shock and, and concern. Uh, but then, what I thought of, you know, if not for the seventy-five percent metal increase at a lower price, for me, it would have been even just a no-brainer. So then I thought to myself, well, if it makes it safer. And we have that need. How could I say no to it? Because of other factors that have jumped the price. So I came back to, you know, do we, you know, do we need it? It seems like we do. I, I think it's it's an oppressive price. I don't know that we do better by waiting to see if metal prices go down. If it's a two-year lead out, and this the machine we have now is hemorrhaging money. But I, I. I hate it, but I feel like it's the responsible thing to uh, to do. But I, I share your shock and concern yeah, over the expense. Bring that up just because it sounds like this is a custom built truck, right? And so that so pretty have. much any time you get into a, a rescue, they're all custom built. Okay. Um, ladders, you, there are cut and dry, like you can just get an assembly line piece of equipment, same thing with pumpers, but rescues are tend to be built uh, for the communities that they serve. Okay. Um, and would this be a fixed price contract? In other words, we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna have another appropriation to cover additional inflation, so that's. No, this is, a, this covers everything as long as I can sign contract by next month. The, the important point as well, because we share your concern as well. Um, the longevity, to your point, um, uh, about the longevity of the truck and the care with which 
we put into this truck. One of the gentlemen here, our chief engineer, Sean McAleer, and, and Brian being uh, the town mechanic is, um, you know, we're servicing the truck and you know we're taking care of it and making sure that it's getting its useful lifespan and beyond that the current rescue 44 is basically at that useful lifespan and and will probably exceed it by the time we get this so um, there's also a degree of maintenance that will go into this truck to make sure that it exceeds that lifespan and we're doing that maintenance on a daily weekly and monthly basis so we share your concern wholeheartedly um, but um, you know it's sort of the nature of where these things are from a procurement standpoint in the state and chief I have a question so what do you do with the engine that the the rescue truck you have now do you scrap it do you oh, no no there we, that's also a dilemma right now Unfortunately, uh, most manufacturers don't take trade-ins, so this is something that we would have to um, try to put up for sale. Um, there, there will be somebody who will definitely purchase this at some point. Um, I just don't know for how much, because uh, now we're talking two and a half years, and let's just say there's some issues. It could be up to three years before we even see this truck. So that's something I'd have to put out to uh, some of the dealers to see what they can do about uh, selling this truck. Is it a $2 million collector item? <laughs> <laughs> Depending on who Cash? wants it, it's possible. Okay, the, input, the metal in, the, in this truck is inflated as well, so don't forget that. Yeah, that's why I'm asking if you want to scrap it, I mean, <laughs> yeah. if nothing else. Mm -hmm. But um, so what happens with the proceeds from that truck? Uh, actually, the label, uh, items one and two, the approval of the prior minutes, and the discuss, discussion of the um, schedule for, the, for 2023. I'll wait on 2023 until we have the new chairs of the committees set up. So we'll hopefully we'll take care of the schedule on on the, our next meeting in December. And I ask any anybody that has any special considerations like timing. I know a few people have mentioned they'd like the meeting to start at um, at 8:30. Um, and I'm hoping if we start at 8.30 that everybody can be on time for an 8.30 meeting. I was going to say, um, so <laughs> they're I, having a hard time making yeah. time. <laughs> so we'll be taking that into consideration. <laughs> okay, uh, briefly, the first selectman's report. Um, I always do like to cover COVID because it is still a factor, although um, October 25th to the 31st, there were only seven cases reported. That's good. Yep, we did have several flu, flu clinics. Sorry about that. Our last clinic was yesterday. Um, Connecticut Public Utilities Regulatory Authority, or PIRA, completed its three public hearings that were scheduled for the rate increase. I did submit a letter in opposition to the rate increase, and you can find it um, on our website. It's um, a tab hooked into our newsletter, so anybody that is not on the newsletter emailing list, I um, highly recommend that. <clears throat> I want to thank all the um, for all of the hard work that the Advisory Committee on Sustainability did. Pleased to say that we received the Silver Award. There will be um, a, a ceremony for this um, on November 14th, and this is up from the Bronze Award that the Sustainability Committee achieved in 2019. So this is really a noteworthy event. Um, I attended the Atrius 25th celebration. Hard to believe they've been in town for 25 years. Um, it was uh, well attended, and I thank Atria for continuing to have a strong role in keeping people in our community, our seniors. Um, I was honored to participate in the Darien Sports Shop Fashion Show in um, support of the Mental Health Task Force last week. They raised $2,750 for the task force, and that was sponsored by the sports shop, Sipsters, and Palmers. Uh, Connecticut Council of Municipalities had their big meeting last week, and um, at that meeting, their, they, one action item is to vote on concepts to present to the General Assembly in January. So you're split in, well, you have the option of joining different committees that weigh in on what they think um, they would like to see based on that committee's structure. 
I was on the land use, and um, I, I have to say that the transit-oriented development bill that was brought forth last year was again a topic of discussion. And I'm happy to report that several other first selectmen and town administrators joined me in vocalizing our opposition to this. And this bill, this concept that came out of our committee, um, the final vote was um, on if it should have an opt-in or an opt-out clause in it. And that was a big discussion at the CCM meeting and a vote was taken and the opt-out um, was attached to it. Wow. I thought what was interesting is that after this large discussion, this lengthy discussion about, um, about the opt-in or opt-out for the, the Todd bill, we then had all of the bills that um, the CCM was considering put up on easels and every member there was given three dots to vote for their top three that they thought the session should, should address. And that bill, when all was said and done, got five votes. So I thought it was interesting, it was a robust discussion about the opt-in or opt-out, but when, when it actually came to does the CCM, do the members actually want this to be brought forward, it was um, a, a very weak, um, weak response for that. So I thought that was interesting. Um, last Friday, I met with the CEO of Stanford Hospital, Kathy Sillard, received um, a tour of the hospital. Um, and Stanford Health will be sponsoring an informational session on the Darien Health and Wellness data um, this, this Thursday at the library at 10 o'clock. So um, I um, encourage people to join that. Um, the CEO from Stanford will be there uh, along with the Senior Vice President Ben Wade and Allie Ramstack from the Human Services Department. Uh, well, it's not critical news, but Linda and I, and Mark, my husband, were happy to be over at the Darien Cub Scouts uh, on Sunday, where they had a little election of their own, and turns out that Kit Kat is a popular candy bar with the, with the Cub Scouts, that, that one. But it was pretty interesting to see how, um, you know, it was a pretty big group. I think it was, I don't know, it was 40? They said about 40, they expected about 40, so I think it was around that yeah. number. Yeah. A good good number of kids, and they, you know, I was able to um, give a little bit of um, information on how the RTM works, also because they had the little dens split up. And oh, I could have been happy. To yeah, come next up. time, I'm bringing you, Seth. Were you a Cub Scout? Yes. Yeah. We lasted one round. Then they couldn't find a volunteer mom to, to do it. They said, no, 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 I've had enough of that. Thank you very much. I was a mom. I was a, I was a den leader. Um, so the last day for the post office is Thursday, and then it, the downtown post office, and then it will be temporarily relocated to Neroten Heights, the Neroten Heights post office, which, as you know, is underneath Palmer's. Um, Beginning on the 11th, the hours Monday through Friday will be 8.30 to 5, and then they will be open on Saturday from 9.30 to 12.30. So we will be following what the post office is doing. We'll be keeping that information updated on our calendar. It's very possible that they will change their hours for, for the holidays, and um, they will let us know the, the permanent location um, they're expected to move into in early 2023 over at Good Wives. There will be, um, Veterans Day is Friday, this coming Friday, and there'll be a brief ceremony um, to honor all of the men and women of our armed services, and that will be held in front of Town Hall, and will begin at 11 o'clock, and that is um, organized by the Monuments and Ceremonies Commission. So again, it's this Thursday at 11 o'clock, and it starts um, promptly. Uh, the town has been awarded the Government Finance Officers Association, GFOA, Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting uh, for the fiscal year that ended June 30th, 21. So this report um, has been, the report has been judged by an impartial panel to meet the high standards of the program, which includes demonstrating a constructive spirit of full disclosure to clearly communicate its financial story and to motivate potential users and user groups to read the report. And this is the 31st year that the town has received this significant award, and, and, it, and it really is an honor to receive it. Uh, we had a few things happen um, at our Monday meeting for the Board of Selectmen, so I want to go really um, briefly over them. 
we came to an agreement with Eversource and the Board of Selectmen voted to approve it briefly. Um, at this point, uh, we started with 100 trees that um, Eversource wanted to take down on, um, on Little Brook. 21 trees were deemed by the tree warden to be diseased or, or dead, so those we agreed to take down. That left 79 trees <clears throat> that the town was not in favor of Eversource taking down. Eversource removed seven of those trees, which left 72. The agreement that we reached would allow 10 of those 72 trees to remain. That was a big win. The position of Eversource was a very strong take all trees down. So to be able to save the 10 trees was a significant um, movement on their part. They will be planting 140 trees um, to replace the 62 trees that they'll be taking down. And um, uh, 60 of them are arborvitae, 72 of them are juniper. So a lot of those trees will be lining up by the um, railroad tracks. So to shield the neighbors from the noise up there and to provide a buffer from the train. Um, another big move on, on um, Eversource's part was an 18 month maintenance plan. So they will um, take a look at one year and any trees with, with, with our group, any trees or plantings that are diseased or, or dead and are not making it, they'll replace. And then they will come back um, six months later and go through the same exercise. And during that 18 months, they will be responsible for watering. So I, I think um, we're, you know, we're gonna get basically two growing seasons in. And the fact that they will be watering, they'll be, um, you know, there's some skin in the game for them to, to, um, to um, main, maintain a good uh, plan there. We will be um, taking care of traffic for one day and the, the trees will not come down before March 1st and the planting plan will be completed by June 1st unless there is a weather event. And a weather event would be, you know, like they said, a sn snow, which I'm not sure we've ever had snow in June, but okay. So basically, by June 1st, the planting plan should be in. And that also includes um, 276 other pollinator or native and or native plants there. Um, so I, um, I do want to give a big thank you to everybody. I want to thank, first of all, the residents for their patience on this, but also I want to um, give thanks to our team, uh, former Jamie Stevenson, our former first selectman who worked very hard on this, our council, Wayne Fox, and um, our Department of Public Works Director, Ed Gentile, who spent, um, um, everyone spent many, many hours on this and persevered. Um, Federal Realty, so the McGuan Playground is scheduled to be replaced, and we're using um, ARPA funds to, to do that. So to save money, the Park and Rec Department was going to take the playground out. To take the playground out for their work schedule, um, they needed to do that now, right? Um, they don't have um, the, um, the time to do it in the, in, during the spring. So the new playground is scheduled to arrive sometime in early June. So that would leave basically seven months of no playground at McGuan. So I reached out to Patrick McMahon, who's um, at Federal Realty, and um, the playground vendor, Creative, Creative Recreation, um, has agreed to take the playground down right before they put the new playground in, but they are charging us $22,000. So Federal Realty has graciously um, offered to um, pick up that. So um, I appreciate that gift, and I, I thank them on behalf of the residents and also uh, especially our, our younger residents mm -hmm. and everybody um, that uses that playground. That's a um, handicap accessible playground, so, so it's a, you know, there are a lot of visitors that would have been impacted if there was no playground there for seven months. Um, the last thing that we did on Monday, um, well, we did several things, but one thing that I didn't think anybody else would cover is we did agree to an increase in the maximum volunteer tax abatement. So right now we have 94 volunteers that receive some sort of a tax abatement, um, either against their property tax or their, um, or their vehicle tax. And we raised that, we increased that from $1,000 to $2,000. So 
um, those volunteers um, will receive an increase in their in their coming tax bill. So that's all I have from the first selectman side. Jill? Okay. Well, it's a little bit of a transitional time of year for us. We've welcomed everyone into the schools, gotten everybody settled, and now we start to get to work on next year already, um, as you all are as well. Um, so we'll start that process tonight. We're going over our teacher's contract, um, and that's um, up for a potential vote. And that, of course, will come your way, Seth, um, in, in the new year. Um, and that was, you know, this is a big, of course, negotiating a teacher's contract is always a big deal. But with what is going on nationally and in Connecticut in terms of teacher shortage, with the fact that, you know, so many of as many of our, our professionals and the people who serve our, our community um, have experienced, COVID was of course really tough. So we were looking to make sure that we could recruit and retain and um, you know compensate teachers fairly. So we'll be having a fuller discussion about that tonight and of course it will be at the RTM in the new year. Um, we have launched our communications committee, our subcommittee, which we're very excited about. We just launched that um, last month. We've had two meetings, and that's going to be a big area of focus for the coming year, how the board communicates. Again, as we all experience, the speed of communication has changed, whereas the speed of government is still fairly steady. And so um, figuring that puzzle out is, is complex, but um, we're, we're committed to working on it. Um, we continue to have a big focus on mental health. It's a, it's a topic of discussion. As you know, we did allocate the funds to hire a director of mental health. Uh, we continue to cooperate with the town. We're very grateful for the work that Allie and her team are leading and that we can be a part of that. Uh, and we're grateful for the school team on the ground, uh, particularly led by Scott McCarthy at this time. Um, to serve our students in that area. It will, we are just moving out of the, the postvention period and into a prevention period. Um, kind of at the cusp, right? And so we'll be doing a lot of work in the schools to support students accordingly. Um, that will be an area of discussion also during the budget um, as that comes forward. What does mental health look like and what does mental health support uh, look like financially as well? Um, Similarly, we continue to focus on, of course, high quality academics for all of our students, um, but also the impact of COVID and what that's meant, uh, whether that's increased identification in special education, whether that is um, making sure that all of our students have the right study skills, um, if there's any gaps, if we need to redress them, um, et cetera. So that continues to be an area of focus. And again, we'll, we'll be talking about, we've got some positions that we had under um, COVID funding that will now be moving off grants to our books. For example, the second psychologist at the uh, high school, some of our literacy interventionists are, are, um, have been funded through grants and we'll be talking about extent, whether or not to extend those positions and if so, they'd go to the permanent books. Um, of course, facilities uh, is a, still a huge priority for us and there's many ways that we see that. Um, I'll talk about security first because that will be coming uh, to the, we're going through a special appropriation process, as you all know, we'll be at the Board of Finance to discuss that on Tuesday the 15th, and then we'll be following up with the RTM, uh, I believe in December. Um, at the same time, of course, the Oxbridge Building Committee continues to work on its build, um, and HHR continues at a, a, a fast pace. There are three, I'll, t I'll talk about HHR more specifically, there are three uh, things that are happening right now from a design perspective. We have had the conceptual design signed off. Uh, we're very excited about that. Um, it's been signed off by the committee and the Board of Education, and so we're now in the design development phase. Uh, we're going through a series of approvals in, in town, whether that's PNC, the Architectural Review Board, et cetera. That's happening last month into this month, and will continue through the end of the year. And lastly, uh, we did go for an additional appropriation. We are taking uh, some roof work, as you both have heard, some roof, roof work from the schools and adding it to our project because we're needing to put a lot of HVAC equipment up on our roofs, so it makes more sense to replace them before we locate the HVAC equipment there um, because we wouldn't want to have to move it later. So we have gone to the Board of Selectmen. Thank you for hearing us on Monday uh, the 7th. We will be at the Board of Finance on this Thursday the 10th to ask for an appropriation from them. And then lastly, we will be to the RTM on Monday the 14th. And we are, um, you know, I talked in communications about the speed of government, but this is an example of 
of uh, where the HHR is very appreciative that government re reconfigured itself. You know, we don't usually do things in the order in which we've done them. RTM's having to bend over. Finan uh, Board of Finance is calling and a special twist meeting. Slightly. And twist slightly. Yeah. Uh, Board of Finance is calling a special meeting, so you know we're very appreciative that that um, you know, the local government has been so flexible, so that we can meet the state deadline of December first uh, and and file our project accordingly. Um, like you get one chance to reauthorize a project, and it is highly recommended that you wait because, particularly with a renovation, but any project, we could uncover some sort of unknown condition that requires us to uh, you know take another look at what we're doing and why. So for something like a known condition, like a roof, it makes much more sense to get that done in your first filing. So that was the recommendation of the state, and again, we're, we're grateful to the local uh, government boards who have accommodated the, the change. Um, and I think that's it on my list. Um, Jill, go back to the COVID employees, yes. a staff. How many people are you, how many people were on grants? Um, on the grant, so we have a, a speech and language pathologist, we have a psychologist at the high school, both of those were at the high school, and we had two literacy coach or inter interventions uh, who were at the elementary school. One position was filled, the other was empty a lot of the time, um, but we'll have to look at all four of those positions. Those are all full time. Those are all full time positions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, we also do have increased identification and in special ed, so while those are the four coming off the grant. Um, and we all have some other things to look at. So those will be the ones we talk about coming up, but I think we're going to be talking about staffing in general. Um, I forgot to mention, sorry, actually on HHR, the other piece is uh, the uh, 32 Hoyt. So uh, we are grateful to the Board of Selectmen and will be to the RTM for trans transferring care custody and control over to the Board of Ed so that that can be used for um, for the Holmes campus. Uh, the final design of that use has not been determined. Uh, probably will be next week. We've had a series of discussions. Uh, the neighbors have been very engaged and we've um, done our best to be very responsive because we do want to be good neighbors. Uh, at the same time, you know, we do want to use the property to its best. Um, so you think next week you'll have a final on, on uh, Yeah, we need to give some direction so that right. they can yeah, right. create their appropriate design documents. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I am finished. Well, uh, you've just stole my it? thunder. He just <laughs> talked about my, my agenda. I, I don't oh. know where to. Uh, I, I might, for the benefit of everybody listening, give everybody an idea of what we normally do in the RTM this time of year. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. We have 100 members in the RTM. So there's a period of time here, right after the election yesterday, when we have to organize all of that. Mm -hmm. So we start off and we have an annual meeting. In the annual meeting, um, the RTM is divided into districts, and at that meeting, there's some very important votes that take place. The chair of the district, vice chair, and the two members of the rules committee. The Rules Committee is important because the Rules Committee sets the agenda for the RTM, number one. Uh, they may be new. Just put that in the back of your mind for a minute. And then um, the Rules Committee also, uh, after this annual meeting, uh, meets, uh, so the annual meeting is the 14th, and uh, then the Rules Committee uh, meets the, four, the uh, 21st to set the agenda for uh, the state of the town. And uh, then following that, they, the most important thing uh, too is that they, they assign these committees so that a week later on November 28, we have what's called an organizational meeting. We generally don't do business at any of these meetings. Instead, the organizational meeting uh, is really just a chance for everybody to say hello, and then they split up into the committees that were formed uh, at the, uh, uh, the week before by the Rules Committee. They all split up, elect their chairs, and set their agendas for the coming year. So you can see there's a lot going on to organize 100 people. Uh, then uh, the next major event is uh, it will be the December the 12th, and that's the state of the town. And the state of the town is really supposed to be a time of reflection 
and looking to the future about what's going to be going on in the coming year. It sets the tone and the pace for the coming year. We have the chairs of all the boards, chair of uh, planning and zoning, all talk about what's happened and where they see things going. We don't like to do business during that for reasons which are, are clear. Setting all that aside, um, we are now uh, adding business to these meetings where we don't normally do business. We have to. As you described, Jill, it's, it's just no way out. So um, on November 14th at the annual meeting, we will do the appropriations for HHR and the uh, transfer of uh, care custody uh, for 32 Ward Street. Um, those are not minor items. You know, we've got about, what, somewhere around $5 million that's on the table for that. So in order to have committees consider it, we've actually used the former committees. So the former committees are gonna get up because the new ones haven't been formed yet. The former committees will get up and report out on these items and we'll vote them. Uh, in addition to that, we have, it looks like, business has got to be conducted at the state of the town and uh, that would we have fire trucks we have uh, school safety officers um, we have donations all of these have to be approved and they've got a, a timeline on them so it looks like that the state of the town is going to get a little crowded um, that's when we will take up those items. In the meantime, uh, the school safety officers, this is, um, there are some aspects of that. Uh, are the people armed or not? And uh, the vote was, I think, that they are armed. Uh, and uh, some discussion on that. Uh, we, we, I received some emails asking for a public hearing, and a, a public hearing doesn't fit this particular situation. Um, so the public hearings, if they were gonna take place, would take place uh, probably with the Board of Education, but, but because they're setting the policies. But um, in deference, since we are voting a lot of money, um, we will, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, I have a, the Finance and Budget Committee and the Education Committee and the Public Health and Safety Committee will have probably a, a informational meeting on school safety expenditures. And uh, those meetings are public. You've got three main committees, and there's an opportunity there for the public to come and speak. So if anybody's got anything to say, we're trying to find a way to allow people to come forward. Are those and, meetings set up yet, sir? Yeah, November 30th. So uh, then we should be well prepared to be able to go forward at State of the Town. It's gonna crimp the presentations of State of the Town, uh, but I, I, I don't see any way out. It's just the way, uh, the, way the, the dice have sort of uh, rolled. Um, other than that, um, we're in the process we, we, of distributing materials out to all 100 members of the RTM to talk about the rules of procedure, how does the RTM work. We, we used to stand up and read some of this, but uh, this time around we're sending it out and writing, say, if you're gonna read anything in the next week, read all of these documents that we're sending you. Great. A summary of Robert's rules, mm -hmm. so you understand what's going on. Uh, the RTM has got a mix. Some people know because they've been in the RTM and some people have no idea. What was that all about? Mm -hmm. And so we'll try and get everybody up to speed as fast as we can. 
So, there you have it. Uh, the 14th is the annual meeting. We'll do some business there. The 21st, uh, the Rules Committee will meet, set the committees, set the uh, State of the Town agenda. And then um, on the uh, 28th, uh, having set the, the rules, having set the committees on the 21st, the 28th, those committees will all meet, form their leadership, and then uh, we'll go on to the state of the town on December 12th. Just a quiet day yeah. at the end of the year here. So the 14th meeting is when you'll vote also on, uh, when do you? We're, we're gonna do, on the 14th, it's Hoyt Street and the three uh, appropriation amendments for HHR. And is that also? And then we also elect the members of the Board of Ethics. And, and your and your rules committee is chosen at that meeting, right? Yes. Right. Okay. All right. Is that the first? They, oh, they also choose the moderator. <laughs> we had a couple of us were chuckling over that. Mm -hmm. So, I guess uh, to put this together yeah. took myself and Lois Snyder several I weeks. I'm sure. Thank you. Because it's not just the the titles; it's mm -hmm. all of the backup materials, yes. making sure everybody's organized. I'm sorry I interrupted. No, 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 that, that's important. Um, so for the state of the town, you have the fire truck, the SSOs, and the, uh, the gift. So how many? So far, I'm less <laughs> I call Kate once a, once a day just well, to we're gonna, say we're what? Gonna, we're going to try to hold to that. But how many committees do you think will be um, reporting on those? Uh, um, yeah. Well, you've got, for the SSOs, you've got three, right? Uh, you've got Ed, F and B, and PH and S. And then for the fire trucks, probably uh, public works, uh, finance, you know, probably two. Public health and safety. Uh, I'm subject to correction on all of this by the rules committee, and they're not shy. Right. <laughs> Maybe public health and safety, too. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yes, clearly. Yeah. And then uh, donations um, probably be just uh, F and B. You do have a park and rec aspect to that. They may want to yeah, chime in. Okay, so you'll have a lot of committee reports on on state of the town. Okay, so I guess guidance on timing would, you know. I'll be calling. Okay, I'll be thinking about that. Okay, thanks, Seth. Uh, any other thoughts? No? Okay. Not only that we like to avoid having to do a lot of business in these meetings uh, at this time of year when we're trying to organize everything. Even though the fiscal year ends in June, there's a lot of other things going on that end in December. And yes. unfortunately, that's just the way this has worked out. Yes. So, all right. We will take that under consideration and um, well I wanted to just show everybody why it's, it's yeah, not a it's, yeah. there's a lot of stuff that goes on just to get us yeah, you're super all busy. on the same page mm -hmm. it's a big body yeah. mm -hmm. a big, big group big November for sure you'll be busy already busy okay so if there's nothing else um, uh, we will adjourn Okay, thanks, 79. ever source regarding this. Okay? All right. Wayne, do you have anything else to add? I do not. Okay. Team, do we have any questions? 
think the only thing would be, is it possible to list some of this information on our website? Is there a way for us to have this so that the neighbors can understand the, the replanting plan and understand mm -hmm. and yeah. see it better? Sure. Because yeah. we, you it's know what? very difficult to maybe visualize what you're saying if you're living nearby and trying to understand where those things are. Right, and you know what? I have a I have the planting plan in my office. Kate, you want to go get it? Yeah. Um, we will we will bring it so you can see it right now because I think that that will help you. Um, but and we will post it on the website for people. So again, the dates to remember March first. Um, that is um, no trees will be taken down before then, and the planting plan will be implemented by. Um, July 1st at the latest of next year. June. June. Well, June 1st, July 1st, if there is a weather event. Okay. And I think um, one of the things that's important to talk about is if we did not approve this, what happens? So Wayne, do you want to? So do you want to cover Wayne that if um, the town um, didn't um, come we to did a conclusion the with the mediator, yeah, what certainly. the next step would be? This is an appeal which was taken under the statutes to Pura. They then had the mediation process, which we went through. If in fact that had failed, then it would go back to Pura, scheduled for an argument before Pura, and the case presented for, to them for a decision by that by that entity. It will be litigated to a conclusion. Okay. Okay. Marcy, any questions? No. Okay. Um, so the board has discussed this at multiple meetings and executive sessions, so um, a lot of our questions are, are answered. Um, I want to stress that I really appreciate the patience of the residents throughout this. This has been um, a, a very a long, a very long process, and um, I appreciate the diligence and the perseverance from from the town side, and that includes former first selectman Jamie Stevenson. Um, want to give appreciation to Attorney Fox and to our Director of Public Works Ed Gentile, who've worked very, very hard to to come to this resolution. Thank you. Um, okay, if there are no other questions. No? Okay. So may I have a motion to approve the proposed settlement of litigation with Eversource? Mercy moves. John seconds. All in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. And if um, we're going to be done pretty quick here, and then I will um, take this round and show you. Um, next item on the agenda is to discuss and take action to approve the proposed settlements of tax appeals. Kate's going to cover this. Um, so you discussed this. Um Wayne updated you on this in executive session. We have three tax appeals um, for each night um, settling lawsuits. Um, and we recommend that you approve them all. Any discussion? Again, something that we discussed also in um, executive session. So may I have a motion to approve the settlement of the case of Aldo Chris Cool Chris Cool Chris Cool? versus Town of Darien to amend the fair market value of the property from $3,427,600 to $3,150,000, effective applicable to the grand list of October 1st, 2019, in accordance with a stipulation for judgment. Mike Moose, Sarah Seconds, all in favor? That's unanimous. Okay, next item is, um, may I have a motion to approve the settlement of the case of Joseph Chris Cuolo versus Town of Darien to amend the fair market value of the property from $1,544,700 to $1,350,000, effective applicable to the grand list of October 1st, 2019, in accordance with the stipulation for judgment. Marcy. Marcy moves. Um, Sarah seconds, all in favor? That's unanimous. Uh, next item is, may I have a motion to approve the settlement of the case of the United States Postal Service versus Town of Darien to amend the fair market value of the property from $3,281,600 to $3,100,000, even effective applicable to the grand list of October 1st, 2018, in accordance with a stipulation for judgment. Marcy moves. John seconds. All in favor? 
Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is to discuss and take action to accept a gift of $22,000 from Federal Realty for the McGuan Playground Project and a request for an appropriation of $22,000. So I'm going to cover this. Um, the town appropriated $175,000 of ARPA funds for a replacement of the playground at McGuan. To save money, the Parks and Rec Department could have dismantled and removed the current <coughs> playground structure, but that would have required work to be done right now in November. That's when they have the, um, the, the time to do it. So this would have resulted in no playground over at McGuan for seven months. The new one is expected to be installed um, late May or early June. And um, this playground is handicapped accessible, so that would have been a hardship for many of the visitors there. The cost to compensate the vendor, Creative Recreation, for the task of removing the current playground in addition to installing the new playground is $22,000. As most of you know, Federal Realty is um, developing the Darien Commons in Neroton Heights. And I reached out to Patrick McMahon of Federal Realty for financial assistance. And on behalf of Federal Realty, um, he graciously and expeditiously offered to gift the $22,000 for this project. So I'd like to thank Federal Realty for this generous gift for our residents, especially um, our, our smaller, younger friends, and those that benefit from um, a handicap accessible playground. Any questions, discussion? Just a really quick question. I don't know if it's language, but uh, if we're accepting a gift of 22000 why are we then appropriating? We just, it's just a pass-through language? Is well, that because it's cash. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's, you know, so, so we're taking it in and spending it up towards that. Right. So in order okay. to spend it, we have to have an appropriation. I didn't know if it was like a 44000 We need to take that nope. gift in and then also spend. Okay. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, that's great. Um, again, big thanks to Federal Realty. Thank yeah, you. Really, um, really uh, you know, I know that the residents are very excited about the project over there, and to to not have this playground um, right down the street, um, I don't think that would have been good. So, I appreciate it. So, okay, may I have a motion to accept the gift of twenty-two thousand dollars from Federal Realty for the McGuan Playground project, and a request of an appropriation of $22,000. Marcy moves. John and Mike seconds. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is to review and approve the minutes of the October 9th, 18th, sorry, 2022 regular meeting. Um, do I have any additions, subtractions, changes? Good. Okay. Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve? Um, John moves, Mike seconds, all in favor? Unanimous, thank you. Thank you, Attorney Fox. May I have a motion to uh, review and approve the minutes of, uh, I'm sorry, next is review and approve the minutes of the October 24th special meeting. Any additions, corrections? Okay, the only thing I would do um, is take out the question mark at the end of the appointments because we did make those. <laughs> um, so if there are no other corrections, with that, uh, with that um, I guess, deletion of the question marks, may I have a motion to approve as presented. Sarah moves, Mike seconds, all in favor? Terrific. Okay. That's it. That was a duplicate, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is agenda review. Are there any topics that board members would like to see on the future agenda? Um, just I so you know we still have the flag policy hanging out there. So. Yep. Ah, see what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything else? No. Okay. Um, and may I have a motion to adjourn? Okay, Sarah moves. Mike seconds. All in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Thank you, 79.
Welcome to another edition of Inside Town Hall. I'm Jim Cameron, your host of this program and program director of Darien TV 79. And this is a show where we're going to be interviewing all the board and commission chairs to explain their work in town hall. Uh, so we're not actually in town hall, uh, and neither is our guest, but uh, you get the idea, okay? Uh, our guest today is Kim Hufford. She is the chair of the police commission, and uh, I welcome you to Inside Town Hall and to the virtual studios of uh, TV79, Kim. Thanks for having me. Great. So before we talk about the work of the commission, let's talk a little bit about your background. Uh, you've, you've served on the commission since 2013, I see. But how long have you been in Darien? What's your, what's your professional background? I am a lifelong Darien resident, Go Blue Wave, class of 83, for those doing the math out there. Um, so I graduated Darien High School. Um, I went to college at Colgate University, um, worked a little while in investment banking, and then got my MBA at um, the Tuck School at Dartmouth. Uh, I have served on, well then after that I worked at Pepsi in marketing um, and then um, ended up home with kids and putting my effort into all things Darien. So um, in my, um, in that post-work life, uh, probably the most notable thing was the new Darien library where I uh, chaired the capital campaign, then ended up chairing um, with my friend Dave Campbell, the building committee, and ended up president of the library when they opened the doors and mm. really um, a highlight of um, my time here in Darien. I think that was probably 10 years of my um, Darien philanthropic life. Um, and shortly after that, I mean, I've served on other boards and stuff, I, but I, I don't think anybody needs to know all the details of mm -hmm. the YWCA and all of that. Um, but then I've been um, on the police commission, as you said, for almost going on 10 years, and um, I also currently serve on the Board of Trustees at Colgate, where I obviously I said I went. So is that enough background? Probably too more, much. More than enough. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about the, obviously, the police commission, because I think a lot of people don't know that even though it's carried, its meetings are carried on TV 79, they might not know that there is a police commission. So... Uh, how, how did the police commission come into being? Uh, how many members are there and how are they appointed? Um, well, that is a good question. And I'm not sure actually before I actually started serving, it is definitely, um, it's one of the longest standing <laughs> groups, but um, probably not known. Um, I do have the town charter in front of me, which since we are not time constrained, if you don't mind, I can read. We are, because I think most people don't want to go to the town charter and look this up. But in Chapter 9, the police commission um, was formed in 1925. We are um, as old as the police department. Um, and it says that there shall be, again, per, per town charter, there shall be a police commissioner, commission of three members, one of shall one of whom shall be appointed as of each July 1st for a term of three years. Um, the commission shall choose a chairman, a secretary from its membership and shall adopt its rules of procedure. No vote or action of the commission shall be valid unless adopted by two or more affirmative votes at a meeting called and held pursuant to its rules. Um, so there are three, there are three, um, there are three of us. There have always been three of us. Uh, the said important details I will go into powers and duties because that's probably more interesting to people. Well, well, let's get to that in a second. But okay, how uh, how who appoints the three members of the police commission? We serve at the pleasure of the uh, first the the board of selectmen, which we interview um, in as it said three year terms. Um, but I don't know if this is the the place to go into this. Um, we serve at the pleasure of the Board of Selectmen, but once we are appointed, um, we are very independent. Uh, so um, we are not subject to differing administrations and elections and... Um, so nobody can, nobody can sweep into the Board of Selectmen and say, 
everybody's off the police commission. We're going to start fresh. I want to hire my own or appoint my own people. Well, we certainly, I mean, again, we, we go in three year cycles. So only one of us comes up each year, but the, the whole point of, um, not, I guess the point, but we were ahead of our time, meaning Darien, in having civilian oversight and independence of the police commission. As you, if you read the papers now, you know that lots of towns um, are actually looking into civilian oversight because they haven't had it. But Darien was way at the forefront of um, making the department and, and the police commission oversight of the department independent so that we are absolutely um, fairness, we can make decisions based on reasonableness, public safety is at the forefront of what we do and we are not subject to um, anything political. We, we are problem solvers. We, I mean, I think Chief Anderson would always say, we like to say yes, we, we are in the business of solving problems for people, but we also, um, have the independence to make very unpopular decisions. Um, we don't always um, make everybody happy, but the citizens of Darien, the employees of Darien, and you know their guests um, can rest assured that we do have an independent. We uh, hiring fine. We are the oversight board of the police, and um, again, we can focus on fairness and reasonableness and public safety and um, all the things that all those people would like us to focus on without fear of um, being replaced or... Um, or again, political influence, as you say. I would say that. Yeah. But there's only three members. Um, I assume you're uh, covered under the um, minority representation rules so that there cannot be more than two members from any one political party we are that's in majority uh but why only three members i mean uh sometimes that's hard to get a quorum you need two for a quorum well again but... it it was um established that way a hundred years ago and i uh having now served almost 10 years um i find it nothing but positive that we only have three members first of all um we can only meet in public session at a police commission meeting because if two of us meet offline or on the phone, that constitutes a meeting. Right. So, um, I, I, you know, I don't know. Again, we're not that political. We, we do all our business. But again, the town residents can be rest assured that anything we're talking about is right there in our meeting. They can watch it on Channel 79. Um, so nothing happens that doesn't happen uh, out in the open. It also keeps all three of us engaged. I, again, I've never served on a bigger commission, but I've certainly served on larger boards. And um, I, I'm not sure that more people, if you have the right people. Uh, we also ha deal with some sensitive issues, as you can well imagine. Uh, and. In my time, I have never, um, I can't think of an instance where there was ever a breach of um, confidentiality. And um, so three members for me feels, as, certainly as chair, but that um, it, we, we deal with some dicey stuff that I'm not going to go into. But, um, you know, anyway, three three members. Works, I, works for you. It absolutely works. And um, we actually, in the last few years, it has been brought to us, should we expand it? Is there a reason, you know, lots of towns were going to, um, c coming to us and asking us, how does your civilian um, oversight, how does your police commission work? So um, we bantered around, you know, again, because someone else posed the question. And uh, we always came back to that um not only was three the right number it was the we, we couldn't come up with a better solution um it works and it works well um so again somebody decided that 100 years ago on may 28th 1925 and uh i have seen no reason to change it and when you open your meetings you always start by saying this is the 2314th meeting of the darien police commission uh how often do you meet and where we, um we are um, our, we set out our calendar to meet every other week at four o'clock on Thursday afternoons. Uh, sometimes that gets switched based on, I, I certainly, A, obviously we need a quorum. And I, with three people, it's not just a quorum. I really like to have all three people there. 
Uh, so again, that's an, another reason to have three because you know you're with five or seven, you could always miss somebody. But we are usually uh, at full strength, and it also depends on. I like to have the chief and both captains there, so it does move around. Sometimes there is just a light agenda, so we cancel. So we we can definitely skip meetings. Um, if anyone has watched us, you know some of our meetings can be twenty minutes. That's the good news. Is um, I think our department runs so well that not a lot of stuff comes to the commission, is, uh, which is what you want. You, you want your chief and your command staff and all your officers to be kind of a well-oiled machine in dealing with most of the stuff. So um, again, it's we post the agenda just like every other commission. Um, you know, the agenda and the minutes are um, there so you can see. But we, I would say we're scheduled for every other week, but we probably meet once a month. Kim Hufford is our guest today on Inside Town Hall. She is the chair of the Police Commission. Uh, we should probably give props to your other two members. Who who are they? Uh, and uh, how long have they been on? Do you know? Uh, Kevin Cunningham and Brent Hayes. And I think, Kevin, I'm going to wing it and say five years. I COVID time, I've lost all years, and Brent <laughs> probably three years. <laughs> okay. But that seems... That's a swing. So when you meet, what do you do? Um, well, what do you, what do you talk about? Issues that come, um, well, before I get to that specifically, I just, I think it's important to, to tell your viewers um, not only what we are, but what we are not. Um, sure. And I hesitate to speak for my other commissioners, but I think it's fair to say you don't want any of the three of us to actually run the police department. Um, again, we are civilian oversight. We are in charge of hiring, firing. We 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 are basically the board of directors. Budget. Um, so, what comes to our meetings is uh, tr we are uh, in charge of the legal. We are the, we are the legal traffic authority in town. So a lot of um, what comes to the actual meetings is traffic issues, uh, speed humps, um, road signage, um, speeding. Uh, you know, if people, they usually go first to Captain Hedema, who is in, in one of her roles as traffic, but um, the residents would come to us. If there's a change in the general orders, um, I'm trying to think of the last big thing that was that we wrestled. Uh, tattoo policy. Um, the general orders is probably this thing. Don, Chief Anderson's probably going to have a heart attack that that's the thing I brought up. But um, changes in general orders comes to us. Um, budget. Um, but the chief, I, the chief puts together a proposed budget and then runs it past you, right? Yes, um, just, just like any other, um, they know what they need and what's on cycle and replacement of cars and um, th big budget items. Uh, you know, we went to um, body cams. You know, obviously we work with the town. While the police commission is again the we are independent. Once we are appointed, we manage um, the police department. Obviously, the town is the budget, so we work with um, Town Hall uh, too. And again, Chief Anderson is on the front line of kind of big changes. Not a lot changes with our budget year to year, except, you know, there's big chunky things that um, we work with the town. They know it's coming, but um, the police commission, the, the budget does not go to Town Hall before we've um, kind of kicked the tires and discussed at length any big, again, body cams was a big thing that the police commission wrestled with for quite a while. Um, civilian dispatchers, again, um, school resource officers, we now have one at Middlesex, we work with the Board of Ed. Uh, again, Don and the command staff, um, Chief Anderson, the command staff, they're the boots on the ground. Again, we are not running the police department, um, but kind of major things like that would absolutely come to us and do people come to your meetings um in person they are wide open and they are all welcome do do people actually come 
not that often. <laughs> We're not the most um, policing. It, you know, people care about it, and um, it's very interesting. But on a, our meetings per se are not that exciting. And again, I want to illustrate that if somebody has an issue or has a question. I have never seen a place that is more open. And so a lot of stuff gets answered by the chief or a lieutenant or, you know, they can come into the police department and get their questions answered. Or if they have an issue, they will get their issue dealt with. Most things, uh, again, I can't be more positive about most things don't come to us because they've been um, adequately and satisfactorily dealt with at whatever level. So if, if people have a, a, a particular complaint, maybe speeding on their street or, um, well, let's start with speeding on the street, uh, they shouldn't necessarily come straight to the commission first. They could come and talk to, they could actually go down to the police uh, department headquarters, walk in and, and say to whoever's the desk sergeant there, uh, I'd like to talk to somebody about speeding on my street. And they'll be triaged off to the right officer or whomever, and they can talk to about the, talk to them, or they could send a letter as well too, right? They can uh, do both of those things. Uh, yeah, and um, they will absolutely get a response. It, usually, they'll be invited in for a meeting. You know, usually there's a file. Here's the history. You know, here's um, where. We're super interested, you know, we, we have officers out on the road, but we are certainly, in, you know, your eyes and ears as a town resident uh, certainly helps us do a lot of things better. Um, but yes, they can come in. What What is their complaint? How best, again, we are problem solvers. We like to say yes. Uh, you know, we certainly can't put a speed hump on every road. And a lot of times it's helpful to explain to people sitting in a meeting, uh, you know, there are rules and regulations. The post road is a, is a state road. You know, you, you stop signs can't be put in certain intersections. Um, so a dialogue is our best friend at the police. And I know Chief Anderson uh, instills that in everybody is interaction. We can't have, I mean, that was one of the things when COVID is, I think the Darien Police Department is top notch in engaging the public. And that's on positive notes, just out and about. And that's also when people have issues. So they can please come in. I don't, not only can they come in, but don't let it fester. Please come in, write a letter, write an email. Um, and if you either can't find the right person, you know, come to the police commission, we can direct you to the right place. But if you don't feel you're getting the answer you want from a lieutenant or a captain or the chief himself, you, you could come to the police commission and say, you know, I raised this issue. Uh, the chief will tell you what he told me, but I'm not happy with the answer. I think you guys on the commission should do something. A hundred percent. My agenda, the agenda, I'll, we'll put anyone, anyone wants to come in to a meeting, it is really easy for us to um, to address it in public session, get everyone's thoughts, feelings, hear, um, and, and interact as well. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and all those meetings are on TV 79. They are. Uh, not live, but uh, on the air, usually within hours of the actual uh, event occurring. Uh, Kim Hufford, our guest today, she's uh, joining us as the chair of the police commission and the show as you our faithful viewers know is inside town hall where we're going to be kind of doing a government 101 approach to who runs what and and how uh, in 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 town government um, let's talk about the department how how large is the department how many employees does it have well um we are 51 sworn officers i believe um but we're trying desperately, like every department these days across the country, to stay at full strength. It's been a very interesting few years in policing and police hiring, and um, I, we kind of have a double whammy of uh, lots of retirements because people were here forever, and the bench, awesome, but we're we're um, we've had quite a few 
retirements and the lists that we're getting to replace them, like everywhere, is growing shorter and shorter and shorter. So, uh, why is that? What? Why are departments having trouble hiring new officers? Well, anyone who's again picked up a paper and looked at the current environment, it has been um, extremely difficult in the world of policing between safety and and the public's perception. The good news is in Darien, we have two things. If you are sitting in my seat trying to hire people, is our town hall, the residents of Darien, and I believe the police commission are extremely supportive of our officers in our department. Uh, there are certainly places around the country that you can point to where um, the police are not feeling supported and their budgets are being cut and, and their headcounts being cut and they're being asked to do more and the environment is not nearly as positive. So uh, the environment for a Darien police officer puts us uh, as a very not popular place to work, but in the in the if you're you're thinking of becoming a police officer, Darien has had very little of what you're reading about on the front page of the paper. We also have great benefits, but uh, not every town is is Darien. So, and just policing in general. I mean, the the world has changed. We're certainly uh, victims of everyone's trying to hire people. It's whether it's police, whether it's restaurants, whether it's nursing. Um, teachers. Teachers, we are not immune to that. And then you overlay kind of the the environment that policing, um, you know, defund the police, not help. There's lots of things that have seeped out. Again, Darien, um, we get the best of the best that are applying. Why is that? We hire the best of the best. So we not only can afford to be picky, but we are picky. Why does, why does Darien, why does Darien attract quality candidates? What is it about Darien's police department or policing in Darien that makes that uh, the police department of Darien an attractive place to work for an officer? Well, again, you know, certainly our um, starting salary, our benefits, the defined pension plan, without a doubt uh, sets us up as a as a place that at least people kind of start to look at. And then, you know, you can look an officer candidate, you know, straight in the face. We are, the town supports us. The budget reflects that. The residents of Darien are supportive. It's a nice place to work. Um, so again, we, um, compared to a lot of places, we have weathered the storm. But having said that, I started this saying, you know, we are definitely noticing where we used to have a hundred officers taking a test. You know, we, we do not have those numbers anymore. And sometimes, you know, they, again, we are, we do a thorough, thorough vetting so they can, um, you know, fail the polygraph or the psych tests or the, I mean, we, we, we have not lowered our standards. It's gotten more difficult and our standards are still high. So by that very nature, uh, we're, we're definitely working a little harder than we did 10 years ago to fill the slots. But, but the police commission actually interviews, reviews all the candidates, the finalists, if you will. Um, it, it does the chief kind of take the all the applicants and call it down to one recommendation or does he give you a choice of two or three and you interview all three and you pick one i mean yeah the list is shorter but how do you choose the finalist the entry level people go through a testing written and oral testing process so that calls the group then they have to interview uh i don't know i I think it's five, but there is a officers and um, you know sergeants, lieutenants, captain in there. They they go through a officer review process. Then um, the, only the top of those people. So you've got a written test, an oral test, the interview. Then it comes to the police commission, and we try to for every opening. Um, not a hard and fast rule, but I would say we try to interview three candidates for every opening um, and because these people are unknown to the chief he sits in on the interviews with the commission so it's four of us 
in the final interview before they then have to go through um, full evaluation of psych and polygraph and this. So it's by the time you're a Darien police officer, not that we don't make mistakes, but um, we think we get pretty darn good candidates that are pretty well vetted by the time. And then they go through a training process before they end up um, on the road. So, uh, yep. So when you're interviewing these potential officers, what are you looking for? What kind of questions do you ask? I mean, you've got their 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 CV in front of you. You probably got their test scores. Uh, I assume recommendations or evaluations from their previous departments. Uh, wh- what kind of questions are you asking? Well, what, there what are, are you two, looking for? I think this is important distinction because there are two potential. Um, type of candidates that come across our uh, you know interview table one is a brand new officer right out of school or maybe they were an accountant or you know maybe they were a nurse or wherever they came from they are not a full sworn officer they have not gone to the police academy and then we get lateral transfers so the questions um, are slightly different You know, you wouldn't ask a lateral transfer, you know, why do you want to be a police officer? I mean, you might, but they're already a police officer. Uh, You know, you say, why Darianne? Why are you leaving? You know, what is, is, do you think is better here? Um, You know, obviously their background, um, you can ask them, you know, stressful situations that they've been in, hypothetical uh, Situ- you know, what, what would you do in this? You can give them case studies. Um, you know, clearly somebody who either had another career or is just coming out of uh, school, um, it's just a different set of, you really have to make sure that they really want to be a police officer, that this isn't, you know, they want to make a career of it. We want career officers. We want people in town for long periods of time. Who, You know, I mean, Don has been, uh, you know, 39 years. I'm not sure we'll ever see, you know, the length of service that we have in some of our senior officers now. That's just not the way the world works these days. Policing, um, it, you know, is an escaping kind of, you know, it's a different, if it's a different world out there. But well, well let's, let's take those two kinds of applicants. Let's take the newbie who's maybe, you know, straight out of college. Uh, first of all, do you have to have a, a bachelor's degree? Yes. To apply, okay. So I've graduated. Uh, maybe I've taken some criminal justice courses or something, or maybe I'm a, a sociology major and I want to change the world from you know one person at a time. Uh, if you choose somebody like that, do you send them to the police academy? I do. And and how long does that take? Uh, longer than we'd like. And with COVID, um, it's not been easy to get seats at the academy. I mean, these are all, but they are all on our payroll, and we pay for them to uh, attend the academy. And where is the academy? Pardon me. Where is the academy? Well, it's moving around. We're hoping that Stanford actually opens one, but it's been online. Um, Milford, it's been, um, I think, is the one that's up and running now with seats available. But um, so it. In the prior world, they would go, they would um, live there. You know, you were at the academy. It was a, you know, police boarding school, so to speak. Um, The whole COVID and, uh, you know, online and commuting. And so they're just getting their sea legs back up. And is it certified, these academies? Do we we know the quality of the education that the officers are receiving? Yeah, no, no, no. you would have to ask Don what the certification is, but yeah, it's you can't just hang out a shingle and <laughs> say, "Hey, I, I want to." Cameron's train Police, police Academy. Let's do it. Right. Let's take. <laughs> but, let's take. Let's take the other example, though. Let's take you. You know, there's a, a, a an opening on the force, and you get an applicant who's been in another police department. Uh, we'll just. We won't. I won't pick out any town, but let's say there's somebody from uh, 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 small town Connecticut. And uh, they've always wanted to work in Darien. Um, One of the complaints that has been made about some police departments is they hire people who've been fired from other departments and they never really investigate why. How how sure are you that these people who are coming from other departments have have really done a good job and not been kicked out or 
left with cause that you don't want to see them come and yeah. bring those bad behaviors to Darien. Our background is is um, our background checks are, are fairly extensive. So I am not worried at all. And it seems that in our officers, we know someone in almost every department everywhere. Uh, and again, Chief Anderson at 39 years, he has the, the bat phone to most other chiefs. So uh, I'm, uh, that I'm not at all worried about. And, you know, we try to balance. It's an interesting question that maybe you didn't ask, but uh, which is better? Is it better to get a new officer? Is it better to get, um, you know, somebody who's, A, we don't have to spend time sending to the academy. They can hit the ground running, training for three months and off they go. Uh, and the answer is we are looking for the best person. Uh, they obviously both have pluses and minuses.